Many of you know I'm a true advocate for taking supplementation to optimize your health, and one of the best things you can do is choose the right collagen. Collagen is a building block to your entire body. I was introduced to Sparkle Wellness product Skin Boost Plus about a year ago, and I've been taking it ever since. Now, they've launched a new bone strength product that I'm super excited about. New Osteo Boost Collagen is formulated to improve bone mineral density, something we all need to think about as early as age 40. Made with award-winning collagen peptide known as Fortibone, the product really has led to meaningful results for people who need significant improvement in this area, including those suffering with fractures or broken bones. Osteo Boost is a great choice for anyone over the age of 40 to reduce the risk of bone mineral density loss, a major precursor to the diagnosis of bone-related diseases. Right now, you can get any of the Sparkle Wellness Collagen Supplements from Amazon or from their website, lovesparkle.life, and use my code DRFIT for 20% off. That's D-R-F-I-T at lovesparkle.life for 20% off their new product, Osteo Boost. to the Fit and Fabulous podcast with Dr. Jamie Seaman. Hello, everybody. It's Dr. Jamie, and welcome back to the Fit and Fabulous podcast. It is so wonderful to have you here today. I have been so excited about getting today's guest on this podcast since we connected last year, and he just released an incredible book that we're going to talk about today. I want to introduce you all, if you have not heard of him yet, to Dr. Christopher Palmer. He is a Harvard psychiatrist and researcher working at the interface of metabolism and mental health. He is the director of the Department of Postgraduate and Continuing Education at McLean Hospital and an assistant professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. For more than two decades, he's held leadership roles in psychiatric education at Harvard, McLean Hospital, and nationally, and spent more than 15 years conducting neuroscience research in the areas of substance abuse and sleep disorders. On top of these academic pursuits, he's continued to practice psychiatry, working with people who have treatment-resistant medical mental disorders using a variety of standard treatments. He has been pioneering the use of medical ketogenic diets in the treatment of psychiatric disorders, conducting research in this area, treating patients, publishing academic articles, and speaking globally on this topic. Most recently, he developed the first comprehensive theory of what causes mental illness integrating biological, psychological, and social research into one unifying theory, the brain energy theory of mental illness. Dr. Palmer, welcome to the Fit and Fabulous podcast. Thank you, Dr. Seaman, for having me. So um, we connected last year when you came to speak at Hard to Kill Summit, and people were mind blown. This idea that mental health, which is a huge problem right now, I think it's finally getting a lot of the traction that it really deserves right now, um, could be related to our metabolism. And so this is Dr. Palmer's book for those of you on YouTube that get to see the video. It is called brain energy. I got it in my hands and oh my gosh, I've been going through it. First of all, it's very easy to read, but it is just full of so much information that I want to talk about today, Dr. Palmer. Um, first off, I feel like everybody has a story in their life that leads them along these roads that we become very passionate about. And the dedication of your book was to your mother. And um, it says, my futile attempts to save you from the ravages of mental illness lit a fire in me that burns to this day. I'm sorry I didn't figure this out in time to help you. May you rest in peace. Can we pay homage to your mom for just a minute and kind of kind of set the groundwork for us? Because I obviously fueled you to go after this project that we're going to talk about today. Yeah. You know, a lot of people will ask me why I'm a psychiatrist. You get, I get a, we psychiatrists get asked that a lot. Um, and, and the real reason is my mom, um, and not in a blame or shame way, not in a, I had an inadequate mother who didn't love me or, but that I had a mother who actually did not have at least a chronic significant history of mental illness up until she was 42. She had a perfectly normal middle-class life, which is what she desperately wanted. She was very hardworking, extraordinarily intelligent, extraordinarily kind and loving. Um, 
and developed a devastating mental illness, a psychotic disorder, what turned into a chronic psychotic disorder at the age of 42. And her life was ruined. Um, and in many ways, my life and my siblings' lives were greatly impacted. My father's life was dramatically impacted. Her whole family, you know, her brothers and sisters, their lives were impacted. <clears throat> and quite honestly, I was furious with the mental health system. I was furious with the psychiatrists. They were giving her pills that sedated her, that made her drugged. She slurred her speech. She couldn't walk a straight line anymore. She couldn't keep her eyes open. She said she felt drugged. She looked drugged. She sounded drugged. And she wasn't any better. That's all they were doing. They were drugging her without helping her. And I knew there was something wrong with her. I That, that was clear. I wasn't in denial about that. Um, but I was furious with the mental health system. I had my own challenges with mental illness. At some point now, in hindsight, I look back and I'm furious with some of the professionals who worked with me back then and what they did or didn't do. Um, so I actually came to the mental health field angry, angry at the mental health field. I was not embracing it. I was not pleased with it, but I, I was passionate about how devastating mental disorders can be, how much they can ruin people's lives, how much suffering they cause. And I was, I have always been certain and clear that these people deserve help. They deserve competent help. They deserve better solutions than what the mental health field is giving them. And that's why I became a psychiatrist. That's really powerful. Um, so tell me, is the way that your mother was treated, is that still how psychiatry is practicing today? Like what is the state of our mental health medical profession right now? Tragically, Nothing has changed, in the, especially in the treatment of psychotic disorders. We give people medications that sedate them. <clears throat> so, you know, let me take a step back in fairness. And I am, I am on the other side of this equation now. Let, let me be clear and unequivocal. I have embraced the mental health field desperately trying to learn the tools that we have available desperately wanting to use them in patients, all of the evidence-based treatments that we have, all the way from medications to psychotherapies to complementary and alternative treatments to electroconvulsive therapy and transcranial magnetic stimulation and ketamine injections. I am trained in all of those. I have prescribed all of those over my career. And I have seen them work. I really have seen them work. For some people, they are miracle cures. There's no doubt about it. I have seen these treatments save people's lives. And I continue to use many of these treatments to this day. But the sad reality is that for more than 50% of people who seek treatment for a mental health condition, more than 50% do not get better and stay better. That is just a sad fact. And for anybody who doubts that, just do your research, look at the treatment outcome statistics. You can go to the medical literature or you can just look at a very easily retrievable statistic. Mental disorders are now the leading cause of disease burden and disability in the United States and on planet Earth. There are more people who are disabled from major depression, plain old depression, than any other medical diagnosis. And that means what we are doing is not working, or at least not working well enough. So you said the words leading cause of disability and disease, but you didn't say the word death. So what do people with mental health disorders 
die from if it's not suicide and taking their own life? So the majority of people with mental illness actually die early deaths. On average, men lose 10 years of life and women lose seven years of life. And to answer your specific question, the most common cause of death is the same in them as it is in other people, and that is heart attack. Heart attacks kill people with mental illness, but at a much more rapid rate. People with mental disorders are having heart attacks at a younger age on average than people who don't have mental illness. Okay. And I want to dive into this. So your book is called Brain Energy. You are a thought leader in this area. If they're dying of the same diseases that somebody without a mental health disorder dies from, what is causing that 10-year acceleration in that disease process? So that is the million dollar question. And it, <laughs> this is, and this is not, you know, this has not gone unnoticed. The people in the mental health field have known this for some decades. For a long time. You know, people, people with serious mental illnesses, the psychotic disorders like bipolar disorder and uh, schizophrenia, they on average are dying anywhere from 10 to 30. 30 years earlier deaths, depending on what studies you look at. So that statistic that I gave you is actually for all mental disorders, ADHD, personality disorders, mild anxiety, depression. Of all the people who get diagnosed with a mental disorder, they're dying early deaths. Right now, the leading theory, the leading theories, according to the World Health Organization, are that it's related to lifestyle. So it means that people with mental illness eat poor diets and they don't exercise enough. They're overeating and under-exercising. Um, and we all know overeating and under-exercising is bad for you. And what causes that? Laziness. Just laziness, pure laziness. Stupid people or people who are indifferent or just don't care, highly unmotivated people. Um, so that's what causes obesity and heart attacks and diabetes. And it's the same in the mentally ill. Usually people don't speak about it with such disdain as I'm doing. I am putting that in there, not because I believe this at all. You, you will I hopefully get that I am passionate. I'm a passionate advocate on behalf of people with mental illness. But this is what people are thinking, and we need to address it. The only way we're going to fight the stigma of this is to say it out loud. They think mentally ill people are lazy slobs. That's what they think. Or we're prescribing all these pills that cause obesity and diabetes and premature cardiovascular disease. So there's a whole other group of people who say, it's the pills. The pills are poison. We're poisoning people with mental illness. It's the pills. There's a line of thinking. The mentally ill don't go to their doctors and follow doctor's orders. If only they would go for their annual health checkups and take their diabetes pills and take their cholesterol pills, everything would be fine. Um, and then there's another line of thinking that says, well, you know, the mentally ill are ostracized and shamed. They are often unemployed or they're more likely to be unemployed. They're more likely to be poor. They're more likely to be homeless. They're more likely to have adverse experiences in life, such as trauma and abuse. And we know those things are associated with shortened lifespan on their own. Um, even in people who don't subsequently develop a mental illness, uh, having high rates of trauma is associated with a shortened lifespan. And so maybe that's playing a role. But at the end of the day, so many of those are about blaming the victim. It's about saying that you just aren't, you're doing something wrong um, and it's your fault. Yeah, wow. So in your book, you talk about the difference between mental state and mental illness, because you gave us some statistics that there's such a high percentage of our population now dealing with mental illness. For somebody listening 
who has experienced, you know, anxiety, depression, whatever it is in their life, how does somebody know when to seek help when it is, you know, pathologic essentially? You know, the, the easiest example that I'll give <clears throat> is anxiety. Um, everybody has anxiety. We all have it. It's a normal part of being a human being. If, you're, if your boss yells at you or if a school teacher yells at you or gives you a bad grade or you get a bad you know, performance report at work, you're going to be stressed and anxious. That is normal. If you're not stressed and anxious, that's actually abnormal. There's something wrong with you. Um, you, you should actually care about those things and develop some anxiety. Those are not disorders. Those, that's called being a human being. Um, do those people need help? Sure. Yeah, it's nice to have friends and family support you and cheer you up or help you develop strategies to, to, to you know, accomplish whatever you need to accomplish or make the changes that you need to make or cope with it or find a new job or whatever you need to do. Um, but that's all normal. There's another bucket, though, in which people are facing extreme extremely stressful or life-threatening situations, trauma, abuse, soldiers on a battlefield. Soldiers on a battlefield are no longer experiencing normal anxiety. They are experiencing overwhelming anxiety and fear for good reason. Their lives are threatened. That is not pathological. Their brains are not malfunctioning. Their brains are recognizing shit. Your life is in danger. Oh my God. Like hide, freeze, panic, run, like run the other way. Why are you running toward the danger? Run the other way. That is all normal and expected. Do those people need help? Of course they need help. If you're being traumatized or abused, we, some, we need to help that person get out of that situation you're a soldier on a battlefield, we need to protect them. Politicians need to be preventing war. They need to be stopping this kind of, you know, um, uh, human violence against each other. And in, until that happens, those people are going to be traumatized and have extreme reactions. And then there's another group of people, people who have anxiety for no reason. They are sitting in the comfort of their home in their lazy boy recliner, watching television, doing nothing stressful, not even thinking any stressful thoughts. And out of the blue, they can develop overwhelming fear or anxiety or panic attack or whatever we want to call it. That person's brain is malfunctioning. That person's brain is producing those same sensations that the other two groups might have, but for no reason. And what I'm arguing is that we really need to distinguish those three buckets in human beings because the first one is normal everyday stuff that all of us deal with. And it's not fair to the other two groups to include them in this normal everyday anxiety. But sometimes people talk about it that way. And that starts to lead to the stigma of mental illness. If you're in one of the other two groups, all the normal people are saying, well, I, I deal with my anxiety. Why can't you deal with yours? Um, people who are in overwhelmingly stressful situations, the, the first line response is to help them deal with the adversity, remove them from danger, help them cope, help so soldiers cope. If soldiers are committed to defending the country and doing what needs to be done against an evil force like Hitler, um, we had to fight. You know, we we had to fight him. We had to fight his armies. Um, that, to allow him to go unchecked would have been a disaster for the human species. So people needed to do that work, but we need to do everything we can to support those men and women who are putting their lives in danger. But people who have a malfunctioning brain, they require a completely different approach. Um, they have a biological brain disorder and we need to help them heal their brain or stop it from malfunctioning. So let's talk about anxiety and depression. Cause I think those are probably, you know, uh, more prevalent than some of the other psychiatric disorders. What are the, what are the current therapies for these patients and how well or how not well do they work? You know, so anxiety disorders 
are a mix. It, it's hard to get really good data on them because, you know, when somebody's going through a divorce, they might get diagnosed with an anxiety disorder, and that's a normal reaction to stress or adversity. Those people will get better within a few months, usually, because they will figure out how to cope with the fact that they're getting a divorce. Um, yeah. Um, and yet a, a physician might prescribe a medication. A physician might prescribe a sleeping pill or an anxiety pill for that person. And that can be helpful for that person, no doubt. Um, so we don't really have good longitudinal studies of anxiety disorders and the criteria are changing all the time. So we have the best data for depression. And the again, so antidepressants and psychotherapy can work for some people. There is no doubt about it. And they are probably better than not doing anything. Um, what percentage of all comers is that the case for? So, you know, in looking at antidepressant trials, we have the best data on that because pharmaceutical companies have to get that kind of data. So of the data that's published, you know, there are a lot of studies that don't get published where the, the results were negative, um, meaning that the medications didn't do anything. Uh, at least not compared to placebo. So this is skewed research, I will admit. But of the studies that get published, the the generally cited statistics are that 70% will have a response, meaning at least some of the symptoms will be reduced, but only 30% will get a remission of illness with the first antidepressant trial. And what that means, so 30% getting a remission of illness, what that really means is that 70% of people, 100% minus the 30% remission, 70% of people still meet criteria for major depression with the first antidepressant trial. That means that although the symptoms might be reduced a little, they are still having enough symptoms to meet full criteria for a continuing diagnosis of major depression. Um, if you follow those people over time, one study of over 400 people followed people for 12 years with weekly surveys, all of them getting standard antidepression treatment, psychotherapy, medications, some of them might've been getting ECT and TMS, it was whatever the clinician thought was appropriate treatment. When researchers followed those patients over 12 years, they found that in 90% of the patients, the symptoms of depression would wax and wane. They kept humming, they would go away for a little bit, they might be reduced for a little bit, but they would come back. Even among the patients who got a rem an initial remission of illness, meaning they had fewer than five criteria of major depression, even among them, over a 12-year period, more often than not, the symptoms would come back, meaning the antidepressant just stopped working. People call it poop out, like the medication pooped out, it just stopped working, we don't know why. So, you, so clinicians are increasing the doses or adding more medicines or changing medicines, or they're doing all sorts of things to try to get the person better. But the sad reality is 90% of people treated for depression have a chronic waxing and waning illness. And that helps us understand why depression is now the leading cause of disability on the planet. Medications that are given for these disorders, are they meant to be used short-term or long-term? And is there a difference in outcomes if they are? You know, standard practice right now with an antidepressant, for instance, is that if somebody has a full and robust response to an antidepressant, they should be treated for at least one year and then maybe try to taper off that antidepressant to see if the depression stays away. Um, the reality is that in, in looking at large population studies is, for instance, in a primary care practice. Once an antidepressant gets started, 95% of people are still on that antidepressant or a different antidepressant five years later. So unfortunately, it is highly unusual that an antidepressant gets started and then stopped. 
<laughs> it, what once you start on that path, you are going to be taking medications probably chronically and unfortunately needing to change medicines Patients to get off of doses. Yeah. Can you, I mean, can you just like for somebody listening, that's never taken one of these. Cause I've been in the situation of trying to taper a patient off these that's highly motivated. And obviously I think very like-minded, you know, with metabolic health, but explain why it's so hard to get off these medications. Even that is a million dollar question. Yeah. <laughs> that, that, <laughs> I mean, is it because you're dependent on the serotonin or the, you know, like the mechanism of action of the drug and kind of like testosterone therapy down regulates your testosterone or. So, so I will start with just the, the fact is that it is extremely difficult to get off all psychiatric medications, plain and simple. It just is um, exactly why I can start. I'll, I'll give some leading hypotheses or theories on why this might be. Um, the medications do change levels and then your body adapts your body and brain and nervous system and gut and everything adapt to those higher levels of serotonin, for instance. And they are often down-regulating serotonin receptors because there's so much serotonin in the synapse now. So they're, the, the cells are actually trying to counteract the effect of the medication. They are trying to maintain balance um, because they sense, well, whoa, where did all this serotonin come from? This is this is not supposed to be here because a medication is not really supposed to be in the human body. So the cells sense, whoa, what's going on? And so they try to counteract that effect. Those counteracting adaptations then put people in a vulnerable state where if they don't take the medicine, now those cells are really underactive because there's not this flood of serotonin and then they have symptoms in response to those cells malfunctioning. I actually believe there's even more to the story and the real story, <clears throat> which we might get to, is about mitochondria, these yeah, little things in our yeah, cells. Yeah, let's talk about that. So all psychiatric medications at the end of the day are impacting mitochondria. And in fact, many environmental influences are impacting mitochondria. There's no way around it because mitochondria, if you want to think of it in a very simplistic way, this is not fully accurate, but a really simplistic and at least somewhat accurate way is mitochondria are the engine of a cell. If a cell is active, mitochondria are active. If a cell is dormant, mitochondria are at least a little less active. Every cell, just like every car on the road, is still running. The car is still running even when you stop at a stoplight. So there's always low level energy required for cells, just for, if nothing else, for maintenance, for repairs, for, for just maintaining a living state. That all requires energy. But when cells are spewing out neurotransmitters or spewing out hormones or contracting, if they're a muscle cell contracting, they require a lot more energy. So at the end of the day, everything's impacting mitochondria and these neurotransmitters, psychiatric drugs are absolutely impacting mitochondria. And they end up upregulating or downregulating the number of mitochondria in cells. And I actually think that is the more useful way to think about the adaptations. Because when you, when you can see the big picture of metabolism and mitochondria, you can actually start to make sense of mental illness and how these medications are working and some of the pitfalls of these medications. And you can start to understand the big picture. I realize I just said a lot that we, you probably want to yeah. unpack. And I <laughs> so, so your working theory is that mental health illness is a brain energy crisis. Would you agree with that? Yes. So I want to come back to that, those three buckets of anxiety that I mentioned. So there's normal everyday anxiety. That is not a disorder. That is not a brain disorder. That is not a metabolic disorder. That is normal human anxiety. If somebody yells at you, your brain is hardwired to have anxiety. That is not a problem. It, it might be a problem for you and it might make you feel really Bonds. uncomfortable and shitty, yeah. but, uh, but that, is not, that is not a disorder. 
The second category of people, people who are extremely stressed, traumatized soldiers on a battlefield, they, they are at very high risk of developing mental disorders and metabolic disorders because of the trauma they are going through. That trauma is assaulting their stress system. The stress system is causing why it's basically causing widespread demand. It's diverting resources from health and maintenance to defense. It's a good strategy. I mean, the human body needs to defend itself. If we die, we're dead. That's it. All game over. So when the brain senses that you are in danger, being traumatized or on a battlefield, um, your body is kind of allocating most of its resources toward your defense. And that means your body slowly but surely over time is going to fall into a state of disrepair because it only has so much energy to allocate. Um, so if, if it's a very short-lived period of stress or trauma, most people will come out just fine. They'll figure out how to move on and they'll be okay. But for people who are already vulnerable, especially metabolically vulnerable, or psychiatrically vulnerable, however you want to think about it, those people can be pushed over the edge from that experience. But I want to focus on that third bucket where people's brains are malfunctioning, where they have a brain disorder. And yes, what I'm asserting, people who have brain disorders, their brains are doing things they are not supposed to be doing. Those people, the reason their brains are doing things they're not supposed to be doing is because of a metabolic problem in their brain. That is the only way to connect all of the science in the mental health and neuroscience fields that we have accumulated and tire, tirelessly worked toward getting over the last two centuries at least. So researchers have been trying to figure out what in the hell causes mental illness? What causes these brain disorders? These are real things. These cause suffering. Numerous researchers and clinicians feel agony and sympathy over people like my mother, who they desperately want to help too. And they've been trying to figure out what the hell causes it. And right now, the field says, we really can't figure it out. It's just too complicated. But we have some clues and the clues are, well, it's neurotransmitters. Well, no, wait, hormones seem to be involved, especially female hormones or cortisol. Those play a role. Um, but wait, no, inflammation, that's involved somehow. And But wait, all these psychological and social factors, trauma and stress and adversity in childhood, all of these things come together to cause mental illness. But how do those things fit together? Nobody can figure it out. It's just too complicated. And what I'm here to say is the only way to connect all of those dots in one coherent way, in one coherent story that helps us understand, and more importantly, more effectively treat these disorders, is to understand that they are all connected to metabolism and mitochondria. So I'm going to summarize summarize this in a way that like maybe my 11 year old could understand it. So our brain cells have mitochondria. They produce the energy for the cells, just like they do for a lot of other organs in our body. So they make ATP cellular energy. Tell me if I've, if I say anything wrong, glucose is what our brains mostly use to go into the mitochondria and make ATP. Agree with that. Yes. So you're saying that there's obviously not a lack of energy in the sense that most people are eating, they're eating glucose, they, they have body fat, like we have energy stores. So there's not a lack of energy, but there's a energy crisis in the mitochondria. So are you saying that the, the, the main tieback for many of these disorders is that the mitochondria are broken in a sense, and they're not able to use glucose efficiently or effectively to do what they're supposed to do? That is a huge part of the story, no doubt about it. And it's probably, it's hard. It's not for as me to simple as that, but. <laughs> it's hard for me to estimate how much of the story that is. That mm -hmm. is a huge part of the story. The, 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 
the slight addendum that I would add is that that mitochondria are dysfunctional. Mitochondria are broken, as you said. There's something wrong either with the number of mitochondria in the cell or with the health of the mitochondria in the cell. Okay. And that means the cell's not functioning properly, plain and simple. But, but to speak to your larger point about not being able to use glucose as an energy source, that just to share with listeners, that has been found. That's called glucose hypometabolism. That's the technical word for it means your cells aren't getting enough energy from glucose. That has been found in Alzheimer's disease, chronic depression, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, personality disorders, at least some of them, and believe it or not, alcoholism. Plain old alcoholism has been associated with that. So it is a, it is a key metric that we need to look at and think about. And, and you and I both know, yeah. It suggests treatments that we might use right away to help people. Yeah. So let's talk about that. You have a broken brain. You have broken mitochondria. There's global hypoglucose metabolism. What is an alternative energy source then for the brain that could possibly help these people? And that is where ketones come in as a potential rescue they aren't the only way to heal the brain. Um, and I, by no means do I stand here saying the ketogenic diet is going to cure all mental illness because I don't believe it's that simple. I do think it is a metabolic problem. And I think it is a specifically a problem with mitochondria. I do think it is that simple. Uh, yeah, but when you understand the complexity of it, it's not that simple. It's not simple at all. Um, <laughs> but uh Ketones. So ketones, ke which you can get from the ketogenic diet. Some people will drink ketones. I actually think, I actually think the, um, so ketones can get into cells and fuel mitochondria in ways that glucose cannot. And one of the primary reasons for that is that a cell actually requires energy to get glucose into the cell, believe it or not. Sounds exhausting. So, so you've got a fuel source that these cells are hungry for, but they have to expend a little bit of energy to allow that fuel source in. Glucose is highly regulated and you don't want a flood of glucose going into cells because too much or too little can be problematic. And so cells have this really complicated system that relates to insulin and insulin signaling that, <clears throat> um, that requires energy in order to regulate how much glucose is coming in. So when a cell becomes energy deprived, that regulating system of allowing glucose into the cell can actually become dysregulated. And at the end of the day, that is something that we call insulin resistance. Um, and it results in something, this thing called glucose hypometabolism. So the, the, the promising thing with ketones, whether you drink them or whether you get them from a ketogenic diet, is that ketones, because they are highly associated with a state of starvation, um, the body is hunkering down and doing its best to survive. And so for whatever reasons, ketones can slip into cells quite easily and fuel mitochondria. And I suspect it has something to do with the fact that they are typically associated with periods of starvation. So the body does not want to have to expend energy to let them in. The body is trying to become lean and efficient and just survive. But we can use that fascinating kind of biological fact, and it is a biological fact. We, we have more than enough research on all of this. We can use that to help people recover when their brain cells aren't getting enough energy and when those brain cells are malfunctioning in ways that we might call mental illness. 
So you brought up this idea of exogenous ketones, which I think is really kind of a, a fascinating area. And it will be very exciting to see applications for these types of things. I met um, Elena Gross this last year when I was speaking at a conference and she does work on migraine and her and I were talking about some of the exact things we're talking about now. But if you, and maybe this has been done, Chris, if you have a, a trial, ketogenic diet, ketogenic diet plus exogenous ketones, standard diet with exogenous ketones, is the use of them helpful or, or sh should really the first step be a ketogenic diet if somebody wants to try this? The first step for people that I'm working with, so if you want to treat a serious brain disorder, um, so I'm talking chronic depression, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, but even for common everyday people who simply want to, um, you know, who are burned out, who uh, have mild depression or anxiety, who have brain fog, who, you know, whatever, these treatment strategies can work for all of those conditions. Um, but you know, and if you have mild symptoms, I really want those people to simply clean up their diet uh, and see if that maybe helps. So get rid of the junk food, get rid of the processed foods, eat whole real foods and see if that's enough. You can still have fruits and vegetables. That's not ketogenic at all, um, but that may be enough. A paleo diet might be enough to help those people if they with brain fog or burnout. But for people with the serious mental disorders that and those are the ones I'm working with, I want to start with a ketogenic diet and not introduce exogenous ketones at all. One of the reasons is because when, you know, so number one is that you're eliminating glucose and carbohydrates, you're improving insulin signaling and insulin resistance. You can drink ketones and still have really high glucose levels. Mm -hmm because you're eating donuts with those, with your bottle of ketones. I have had patients try that. It has never helped even one of my patients yet with a serious disorder. Although some people will use, drink ketones and say, I feel sharper. I feel a little better. So maybe somebody with that brain fog might use exogenous ketones while they're eating donuts. And maybe for that person, it will be helpful. I don't think we have enough research yet to really know for sure. Um, action would only be like an hour or two. So it's like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. But the patients that I'm working with, the, you know, the ketogenic diet is doing much more than just introducing ketones. It's actually changing the gut microbiome because of the change in your diet. It is also um, the, the thing that's really important to my theory is that it is when you force your body to make the ketones, ketones are actually made by mitochondria, primarily in the liver. That's where they're made. And so when you are on a ketogenic diet, your liver actually increases the production of mitochondria in your liver cells. And so your liver cells will actually have more healthy mitochondria as a result. And I have lots of reasons to believe that can have powerful, beneficial effects on brain health. And um, so it's, it's really, the ketones are almost just a biomarker of these much larger metabolic changes throughout the body. Um, and, uh, and I think I would start with ketogenic diet alone without any exogenous ketones. It's also benefiting the other risks, the reasons why these patients die, the same reasons that everyone else does, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, cancer. So, you know, it's, it's, it's helping in lots of different ways. And I think that's one of the misconceptions of the ketogenic diet is that it's just been sold as a weight loss thing. It's just a fad. Um, and it's not these ketones work through cellular signaling mechanisms. Can you highlight maybe just for people Besides providing energy, what do ketones do at a cellular signaling level that is also helpful for these patients? So I'll, I will, I will, if I can modify your question. Yeah, go for say, it. Mm -hmm. and, and, and modify it to say, what can a ketogenic diet do? Because again, it's, yeah, it, it's, it's not entirely clear the ketones themselves versus all of the changes that are happening in the body 
when people do a ketogenic diet. But for any listeners who don't know, the reason I'm so interested in the ketogenic diet is that it is a 100-year-old evidence-based treatment for epilepsy. It can stop seizures even when medications fail to stop seizures. And that is important to me as a psychiatrist because we use epilepsy treatments in psychiatric patients all the time. Lots of psychiatric medications are actually epilepsy medications. So this is nothing new. I am simply using an evidence-based dietary epilepsy treatment in patients with mental illness. We know the diet changes neurotransmitter systems. It decreases brain inflammation. It changes calcium signaling in the cell. It changes gene expression in cells. It changes the gut microbiome in beneficial ways. Um, it has anti-aging effects in terms of its effects on levels of something called NAD and in terms of something, um, some genes called sirtuin genes. Um, it, so it, it has widespread effects on whole body metabolism, mitochondrial function, and brain kind of brain activity and brain function and brain health. So your patient comes in, you propose to them trying the ketogenic diet. How do patients get started? I have a couple questions. Do you have them check ketone levels? And then third part of that, how quickly should someone expect to possibly see changes? Like if it's working, because you've treated so, patients like this. So this is like beyond the level of like theory, like you've applied it in your own clinical practice. Yes. And so the first thing I want to say is if you have a serious mental disorder, please do this with a clinician. Why? Not because the ketogenic diet is dangerous, but because the ketogenic diet is powerful and you have a serious, sometimes maybe life-threatening mental disorder. So if you've had hallucinations, delusions, if you have ever been manic or hypomanic, if you have ever been suicidal, if you are self-injuring, if you have an out-of-control substance use disorder, please get responsible you know, help to implement this treatment so that you can be safe. I just want people to be safe because when you use a really powerful treatment against a dangerous disorder, things can get kind of scary quickly if, if you don't know what you're doing. So with that said, um, I'm going to take the worst of the worst. I'm using patients with chronic depression and or schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. I'm implementing the ketogenic diet with them. Uh, I am definitely measuring blood ketones. If you have chronic depression, I'm looking for ketones above 0.8. If you have bipolar disorder or schizophrenia, I'm unfortunately putting even more pressure on them and they are more disabled usually. I'm putting even more pressure on them to try to get ketones above 1.5, wow. um, blood ketones above 1.5. With the mood symptoms, so the first week can be significant and dangerous that people call that keto adaptation or keto flu. And just everyday people who are trying to lose weight, they can feel like shit. But in people with serious mental disorders, their symptoms can actually get worse and become dangerous. So this is one of the reasons I really want you working with a mental health professional or a, at least some professional. Um, you know, we could talk about electrolytes and other things to get involved with, but usually within one to two weeks, most people, once they get through that keto flu part, will start to notice an antidepressant effect. Some people can become hypomanic within the first month. I see it commonly, even in people who've never had bipolar disorder. I've seen it in weight loss patients. They will start sleeping less, less than they've ever slept. Like they're only getting five or six hours of sleep a night. They wake up and they're wired. They're like, oh my God, this is the greatest diet in the world. I feel great. They're going out shopping. They're, they're enthusiastic. Everybody notices a change. Some people call this keto clarity. <laughs> so there are all sorts of things. So 
I tell watch people I can that. smell colors. I can smell colors <laughs> when I'm in ketosis. So watch for that. Um, and again, not because I'm going to downplay it. If it's, if it stays at hypomania and it's not a problem, that's wonderful. You're, you're on cloud nine and that's great and enjoy the ride. Um, but if you have a serious mental disorder that could spell trouble. So just, I want that monitored for people with psychotic symptoms. So I'm going to take the extreme version. They're hallucinating and delusional. They've been this way for years or decades. It almost always takes a minimum of six weeks to see a significant antipsychotic effect. And for some people, it takes two to three months to see a significant antipsychotic effect. So it, the ketogenic diet begins to look more like a medication trial in those patients. So I usually, I usually tell people up front, if you're using the ketogenic diet to treat a serious mental illness, I tell people I want a three month commitment from you. Um, not that I'm going to sue them if they don't do it, but, <laughs> but I tell them yeah. you've, you've got to give this, if you're really going to give this a real shot, give it a full three months and then we will assess. And at three months, we assess two things primarily. So the first thing that I'm assessing with them is, has this diet changed your symptoms in any beneficial ways? And that's going to be a yes or no. And we might get granular about what symptoms and how much of a change and everything else. But the second thing I'm going to assess, but I'm only going to assess it at three months, is is this diet now sustainable for you? I'm not going to make that assessment on the second week because on the second week, a lot of people are kicking and screaming and complaining. I want bread. I hate this diet. There's no way in hell I can do this diet the rest of my life or even for a year. What's the point in living if I can't have bread? Um, they're saying all of that at two weeks, but at three months, you'll be shocked at how many people, if they can get through three months of it, you'll be shocked at how many people will say, wow, I feel so much better. My symptoms are so much better. And shockingly, I don't really miss bread as much as I thought I would. Like, I think I could live without bread, especially given that I have a whole new life. Like I've got a new brain. I'm, I feel so great. My symptoms are gone. Like I could do, I can do this. I, I can stick with this plan. So I don't know who your longest patient is that you have, have worked with, with ketogenic therapy, but you know, like with diabetes, for instance, like I used to have pre-diabetes. So I went on a ketogenic diet, restored my insulin sensitivity. And now because of the level I work out and how much muscle I have, I can eat a low carb diet and, and have normal biomarkers and function great for patients with serious mental illness. Does this tend to be something that they're going to have to sustain for their life? Or is this kind of like peripheral insulin resistance where they can somehow fix this and then at some point start to reincorporate, you know, more of a, a low carb diet or what's your thoughts? So the real answer is we don't have enough cases. So I can, I'll share some anecdotal cases with you. We don't have enough rigorous research over long periods of time to be able to answer that definitively for serious mental illness. However, we do have a lot of rigorous treatment trials in the epilepsy field. And that serves as a good proxy for mental health because again, there's a lot of overlap between epilepsy treatment and treatment for serious mental illness. In the epilepsy field, patients are told you've got to do this diet for anywhere from two to five years. And then we are going to, you know, and that the clinician will help you make that decision about whether it's two years or five years or whatever. And um, and then patients are usually actively encouraged to transition off the diet. The majority of patients, more than 50% of patients are able to stop the diet and maintain all of the benefits that they got from the ketogenic diet. So it is not a lifelong treatment for epilepsy usually. It is a two to five year treatment to literally heal your brain. Um, and it's healing the mitochondria or increasing the number of mitochondria in your brain cells. And once those are, once mitochondrial health is restored, your brain health is restored, and you can likely 
process a quote unquote normal, hopefully not highly processed food, but a, a normal healthy diet um, that may include carbohydrates as well. Um, in, in patients with serious mental illness, the longest patient that I'm aware of was a patient who had schizophrenia for 53 years. She went to Duke University, Dr. Eric Westman's clinic for weight loss, only wanted to lose weight, um, ended up uh, you know, using a ketogenic diet. Within weeks, her symptoms of schizophrenia were gone. She remained in full remission from her schizophrenia off all psychiatric medications for 15 years. Um, unfortunately, she passed away. She's, she was 85. She passed away about a year ago from COVID pneumonia at the age of 85, but she remained symptom free. She followed, I think, you know, she lost like 150 pounds and kept it off. She continued to follow a low carb diet, but had plenty of cheats around the holidays. She would cheat, you know, special occasions, she would cheat. Um, and her symptoms would not come back, but I think mm -hmm. she would always drift back toward a low carb diet. Fascinating. Fascinating. So I'm going to strong arm you into a, into a second episode because I, I want to, at some point talk about pregnancy and epigenetics and kind of its role in, in, um, how some of these mental health disorders develop. And then of course I want to talk about alcohol because as my followers know, after you and I, uh, <laughs> saw each other at hard to kill summit, um, I got essentially called to the carpet on stage <laughs> <laughs> about, uh, signing away, uh, any alcohol use. And so I have been um, sober since October 1st. It's going so well, Chris. And really, to be quite honest, I don't know that I'll ever bring it back into my life. That's just kind of how I feel right now with this little experiment. So I really want to tip my hat to you because uh, Chris shared that he had gone alcohol free um, in, in his life in, in the last couple of years. And it's uh, it's been amazing. So, okay, Chris, tell people where to find brain energy, how to find you, follow you and all the amazing work you're doing. So the easiest place is brainenergy.com. Um, so you can find resources there. Uh, you can um, find uh how to buy the book if you want to. It's available at Amazon, Barnes and Noble, and other booksellers. Um, you can follow me on social media if you're on social media and you want to do that. Um, I'm always posting new research that's coming out. Uh, you can sign up for our newsletter. We really want to start a grassroots movement. We want to see big changes in the mental health field. We, um, I and many others, researchers, clinicians, philanthropists, passionate about this because we are seeing patients' lives changed for the better. Patients who could not get better with standard mental health treatments. And uh, and we want these treatments offered to everyone. Incredible. Well, thank you guys. You guys go check out Brain Energy, brainenergy.com. We can put the links for it here in the show notes. And I know that you're going to impact uh, more lives than you'll ever know. I just, I, because, okay, maybe I'm a little biased, but... <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks everybody Thank for listening. Did you guys love that last episode of the Fit and Fabulous podcast? Well, of course you did. And I want to keep bringing you the most amazing content from the most incredible people. And you can help me by subscribing to the Dr. Fit and Fabulous channel. You guys know where the button is. Just click it. It's the doctor's orders.